you. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I am going to talk about my book, as you just heard. And um, in this talk, I'm going to cover why we have all of these accents of English in England, because the book looks specifically at accents in England before going on to some other things. Um, what can your voice give away about you? So what can somebody tell about you just by listening to the way that you're speaking? Um, why, can't make the, uh, why can't men make their voices sound sexy? This is a question that I was <laughs> asked about. And it was actually um, on the show Duck Quacks Don't Echo asked about this. It's not my research, but it's quite an interesting look into um, how we can change our voices for different things. Um, how do transgender people feel about their voice? I did some research with uh, some transgender speakers looking at how they feel their voice represents them and uh, looking at the difference between people who have transitioned from male to female and female to male and what was going on with their voice. Um, and also just something about writing a popular science book in case anyone's interested in doing that. Um, just some hints and tips. You may feel that it's something for you. I really enjoyed the process, I have to say, but it did have its ups and downs. Um, so just to start with, when we are um, very, very tiny, even before we leave the womb, we are picking up information about speech patterns to do with our native languages. Now this could be, of course, in a bilingual setting. Is anyone in the room bilingual or multilingual, more than one language from birth? Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So you may hear more than one language, um, but what you will hear is um, the language of your mother um, and through vibrations, and you'll also hear um, the language of people who are close to them. But what we're generally hearing when we're in here from about five months onwards, we're hearing pitch patterns. So we're hearing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing that we're hearing. And as the per person goes about their daily lives, you know, just, oh, I'm washing up, hello, oh, hi, you're home, yeah, good, I'm going out to the shops now, I have to go to work, I've got a really important meeting, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You, we're picking up all of these sorts of patterns, but we're listening to the pitch patterns and the prosody. And what's interesting is that it has been found that with really, really young babies, neonates, it's already possible to identify the pitch patterns of the languages into which they're born. You can do this with neonates. So why is this the case? Well, it could be because Basically, the brain focuses on patterns and also from a survival point of view, it's really important that you fit into the social group that you're born into. So this is probably a, an evolutionary strategy to enable you to be, from birth, identifiably part of that community into which you've emerged, which is just extraordinary, isn't it? That just from so early, this is the case. So language pitch patterns, they're something that are with us from a really, really young age, and they stay with us. Okay, I'm just gonna ask you about this thing. Okay, how many people in the room are native speakers of British English? Because I know we've got lots of nationalities in the room. Okay, look at, look at this item here. Your mouth may be watering. Um, do you pronounce this to rhyme with cone? or do you pronounce it to rhyme with gone? Okay, have a think. So, is it cone or is it gone? Who's a cone person? Stick your hand up. Okay, counts if you're a native speaker of the varieties of English as well, yeah? Okay, you're a cone person. Gone people? Right. This actually splits families. When I give a talk about this at our open days and, and visit days and so on, I have parents who say, oh, it's definitely this, and kids who say, no, it's that, what? We've never really talked about this before. And it was the case with my mum. My mum would say scone and I'd say scone. Why have we got this difference? What is going on? There's been some fascinating research done by a colleague of mine, um, Adrian Lehman, and I'll show you what his app looks like in a moment. Um, but he asked people how they pronounce this word, and this is for the whole of the British Isles. So if you are from Scotland or the uh, <coughs> north of England, then you'll definitely say gone. If you are from Southern Ireland, you will definitely say um, scone. 
If you're from Northern Ireland, which is actually a branch of Western Scots, you will definitely say scone. So we've got this delimitation here in Ireland. But if you look at England, it's, it's all a bit mixed. Am I going to be able to get this to come? No, it's all a bit mixed here. So if we look at this here, it's more sort of yellowy. Now we've got some places in England where it would be pronounced as scone. We're not entirely sure why. why. Why would that be the case? We know that there's been quite a lot of immigration from Dublin to Liverpool, for example, but there's not, it's not the case that people say scone around there. So why have we got this area here where people say scone? And why are people down in sort of Hackney, Essex, why are they saying scone? Why are they doing that? More interestingly, if you're British, you'll get this. In Cornwall, you're more likely to say scone. But in um, Devon, you're more likely to say scone. And uh, Devon and Cornwall also have an argument about which way you put the jam and the cream on. So we've got, we've got actually an accent delimitation there as well going on. I'm from Kent. I'm from this little bump here on the end of Kent. Um, and actually, it's more orange than it is green. Um, so you'd expect me to say scone. And my mum was actually from Bexley, so you'd kind of expect her to say scone. But why do we have this difference? Why do you think we have this difference? What's going on there? Why do you think some people would say scone? Apart from, unless you're from those, those language groups specifically. Any thoughts? Yeah? Were there any popular television shows when you were growing up that could have been pronounced? That specifically mentioned scones and scones? I, I don't think so. I can't, I can't think of any. I, I will tell you though that I, um, I was in Australia in the summer for a conference and we went into a cafe and they had some of these, these things piled up. And the person behind the counter was speaking to another person behind the counter and they were talking about scones. And then um, I went up to the counter and said, could I have some tea, please? And she said, oh, you're from, you're from England. She said, would you like a scone? <laughs> and I said, that's interesting. You said scone there when you spoke to me, but you actually said scone when you spoke to your colleague. She said, oh, yeah, but scone's more posh, isn't it? <laughs> so maybe it's got to do with that. Maybe people from this area of the country are thinking, well, it sounds more posh to say it that way. So we've got these sort of judgments about individual words, about the poshness of words, pronunciations, about whether something is the right way to say things or not. These, these are things that people argue about. It's extraordinary, but they do argue about these things. And it's good for me because it means I get to come and talk to people like you about it. This isn't the end of this research, however. Um, there, were two, there are two major surveys of English that I'm going to be referring to. The first one is the Survey of English Dialects, and this was done sort of 1950s to early 60s um, by Harold Alton, uh, Alton and colleagues. Um, and it's called the Survey of English Dialects, and we often refer to it as the SED, so you see that referred to. Um, and the other one is, is the app material I just showed you, is from my colleague Adrian Lehmann's English Dialects app. It looks like this. So if you wanted to download the app and have a play around with it, um, you could do. It, it asks you lots of different things, not just about pronunciation, it asks you about dialect forms as well. If we compare the data from these surveys, we get some really interesting things. So this is from the earlier survey from the SED in the 1950s, and this is how many people pronounce the R sound in the word arm. Now, I don't. If you're American, you will. Um, and if you are from the west country of Britain, of, of England here, you may still do. But we can see here in the 1950s, there's actually quite a clear division between people who would say arm, including Kent, where I was brought up, and people who'd say arm on the eastern side there. Um, but we've got these two interesting little pockets going on there. If we look at the later data, so this is from 2016, we can say, see that in England, hardly anyone now will say arm. Most people will say arm. And where they will say arm, we're right down here in, in the sort of Devon and Cornwall, West Country, Somerset area. Bristol seems to be quite resistant as well. Um, so Bristolians have an identity and they, they preserve that feature. It's probably something to do with it. But nowhere else in England will say arm now. It's just gone. It's completely gone. What do you think the reasons for this might be? Let me just give you a bit of background then before we think about that. This map is a map of England showing the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the Danish districts. 
Um, so this was before 1066, it's around 900 AD basically we're looking at here. And we can see that we've got the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, if we focus on England, we've got those in this area here, including Kent. Um, and then we've got the, the uh, Danish districts, which were more on the east side and more up to the north. But interestingly, we've got these two little pockets here. So the language that came with the Vikings was R-less. They wouldn't have said the R in words unless it was at the beginning before a vowel. Whereas from the, from the Saxons, we do get that feature. We get R pronounced everywhere it is in the spelling. And if we compare that with the map of the 1950s, um, this here, this is Watling Street. This is the A5 going all the way up from London to Liverpool, basically. And we can see that we've got a very similar situation with this settlement. So it's to do with people, it's to do with migration, it's to do with where people were based, whether they stayed put or not, whether they were mixing or not. We can see we've got these patterns. And here are these little blobs there where there were still Saxons in those areas and they are R-ful. You would have said the R there. So what has changed between the 1950s and, and now where we see this spread where nobody has the R anymore, yeah? Television, so mass media. So everybody went out in 1952 and bought a TV so they could watch the Queen um, be crowned, basically, to watch the coronation. Not everybody, but lots of people did. Television, radio, being able to hear lots of different dialects. So they're coming to us now. We don't have to go to them. But is there anything else that might be going on? How many of you live outside of London and migrate in to work? OK, quite a few. There's that as well. Our transport links since the 1950s have changed massively. We've got motorways, we've got high-speed trains, um, we've got different ways of getting from A to B which are much easier than they were before. So we find that people are migrating around a lot more. So not only is the language coming to us, we're going to the language and we're meeting and we're seeing this thing called dialect levelling where we lose the differences between, um, between different accents. So what do we mean by accent and dialect? Accent is basically phonetic and phonological features, so pronunciation features, whereas dialect is lexical, vocabulary and grammatical features. And I'm not looking at this um, in this presentation. I'm interested in, in this part there. Um, and accents and dialects can be there for a number of different reasons. So they can be regional, they can be social, occupational, stylistic, ethnically based, they can be age based, gender based, sexuality based. Can you think of any others? Any other things that might mean that you've got a different accent or dialect? They could be occup yeah, occupational based, job based. It's not the case that it's just to do with different regions that you're in. It is sometimes regional but not always the case. So it's, it's not necessarily regionally based. They are not low or substandard varieties. Um, Accents and dialects are all over the country, everybody's got one basically, so it's not the case that they are necessarily thought of by others as low or that they are low or substandard. It's not the case that they're rustic associated with farming or associated with the working, cult, uh, working classes or associated with urban areas or industry, that sort of thing. It's not the case that they're old forms that are now dying out because we see new forms coming in. So it's not the case that they are all old forms. And they, it's also not the case that they're not codified. They do have observable rules. So it's not the case that people are just doing things with no rules at all. There are rules to the way that we use different accents and dialects. So who has an accent? Yeah, everyone does. Everyone has an accent. So you can't say if you're speaking in a particular way, so my accent is often taken as an example, that I don't have an accent and everybody else does. It's not true. I have an accent. And I definitely know that when I go abroad, if I go to places like Australia and the United States, they always say, oh, your accent's so interesting. Everyone has an accent. OK, we're going to focus on what your voice can give away about you. One of the things that I do um, in my professional work is I work um, in forensic phonetics, and that is comparing voices or looking at the way people speak to see what we can tell about them. Does anyone remember this business from a little while ago? This, uh, this is Jihadi John here. 
Um, and he was involved in um, a number of beheadings of um, people from the West. This is James Wright Foley, who was an American journalist. And uh, the media were very interested in him because he had a British accent. So me and a number of other people who do this sort of work were interviewed by the media and we appeared in, uh, in newspapers and on the television and so on, talking about what we could say about this accent because they were saying, well, if it is British, where is it from? So what could I tell about this person just by listening to their accent? Well, first of all, I could tell that they had um, a multicultural London English accent. And this originated around Hackney um, in northeast London, but now it's actually quite widespread, but it's a relatively recent accent. Um, also, just by listening to the way that he was speaking, he sounded quite educated. So I suggested that he, he, he's probably educated to university level, just by listening to the words that he was using and the way that he was speaking. Something else that, that I was asked is, um, and this is always something that newspapers are interested in, is whether he was an immigrant. And I said, well, it's really difficult to say um, whether this person is an immigrant, but from my point of view, listening to the way that he speaks, if he did come into Britain um, from outside, then he would have done it quite early. So he would have come in maybe before the age of 10, certainly, because he doesn't sound like a non-native speaker of this variety. He sounds like a native speaker. And the older you get, the more difficult it is to have a native-like um, variety wherever you're based. So my suggestion was that he was an early bilingual. So if English was learned as a second language, that it was between the ages of five and 12, but it wasn't any later. Um, so in that case, this person wouldn't be a recent UK immigrant. When it was eventually revealed um, that he was Mohammed Mwazi, all of these things were right. Now this is a little bit like horoscopes, isn't it really? A little bit like horoscopes, but the fact that you can tell things about people by the way that they speak is, is very interesting. But also some people make judgments about this. They don't just say, ah, oh, this is what's going on and that's my job to be um, objective. They'll say, oh, well, this person must be an immigrant. It's that sort of thing that we get. And, and I was asked if I thought this person was an immigrant, which I thought was interesting. So. I tend to look at it in terms of whether they're a, a bilingual and if that was an early or a late bilingual. So we can tell things about the way that you speak um, and we can analyse samples of language and say whether we think it's likely that it's the same speaker that produced it. Um, so your voice can actually re reveal quite a lot about you. OK, let's move on to why men can't make their voices sound sexy. Um, a study by Susan Hughes and colleagues looked at whether men could make their voices sound sexy. They took 20 men and 20 women, heterosexual men and, and women. Um, they got them to count from one to 10 using five different vocal styles. So one of them was normal voice. So just count from one to 10 in your normal voice. Then they asked them to do it in a dominant way, uh, in a confident way, in an intelligent way, and in an attractive way. So if you're going to try and attract a member of the opposite sex, counting from one to 10, how would you do that? <laughs> Interesting. Um, then what they did was they got 20 male and 20 female heterosexual listeners to rate the speakers. And all the, all the speakers improved in dominance, confidence and intelligence. Only women improved in attractiveness. In fact, the men's voices were voted as less attractive if they tried to make them sound more attractive. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? So why is this? Why, why is that the case? Um, Hughes and colleagues put this down to evolution, basically. So what they said was, for women, what you're looking for in a man is somebody who is dominant, confident and intelligent. You want somebody, who, from an evolutionary point of view, you want somebody who can go out there, bring home the, the food, fight off the competitors, protect the family, that's what you want. But from a, um, a male point of view, from what they wanted out of women, was somebody who sounded like they could um, cope with children, look after kids, be, be sort of loving and gentle and all of this sort of thing. Um, that, that was what they wanted. And interestingly, if you have a voice that sounds like this, so this is like the, uh, 
the Marks and Spencer's chocolate pudding advert voice, okay. you've got this sort of voice, then somehow it's also correlated with how attractive you are. People expect you to look attractive. So they just put it down to straightforward evolutionary reasons. So women don't care if men can make the voices sound this because they're not looking for the qualities that that kind of voice conveys. They're not actually looking for that at all. Another thing that came up was something called competitor derogation. So women rated men's confident voices as more confident than their normal voices, but men didn't. Why not? So what Hughes suggested is it could be possible that men are bio-programmed to deliberately downplay the confidence of competitors. And so they would not rate those confident voices as more confident. They just wouldn't do that. Um, and there are, of course, implications for politics here. We see this coming up in, in politics where people downplay um, how, how confident people are, how um, competent they are at doing their jobs. OK, how do transgender people feel about their voice? As I said, I did some research. I interviewed a number of transgender people um, about their voices. If you're a transgender person, you may transition from female to male. And if that's the case, you're usually given testosterone, which causes the body to go through male puberty. And one of the effects of that is that your voice will change quite dramatically. For most, for most male speakers, you get this thing called the, the voice breaks. Um, and sometimes you get this kind of squeaky period where it's kind of doing something you don't exactly know what it's going to do. Would, would any men in the room identify with that? OK, something that passes quite quickly, but it, it's, it's there for a period of time. So you go through male puberty and then your larynx enlarges quickly, just like you shoot up in, in height. Um, and this changes the way that you sound because you then sound, uh, you, you sound like you have a lower voice pitch. For male to female transitions in adulthood, this is more problematic because changes to the vocal apparatus have usually already happened. So it's quite difficult to make changes to um, the way that you speak from that point of view unless puberty blockers have been prescribed. So if you identify very early on that you're in the wrong gender, you've been born into the wrong gender, then with the permission of your parents, it's possible to get things called puberty blockers that stop the process of puberty happening. Um, but this is still not particularly common. It's quite difficult to be prescribed these for, for all sorts of reasons. In any case, it's not impossible to change your voice if you, haven't, if, if you haven't had puberty blockers. It's not impossible to change the way that you speak, but it is a challenge. And I've seen some videos, I'm not going to show you any of those, but I've seen some videos where with specialist speech therapy help, people have really changed a lot in the way that they sound. Their voices have changed, the pitch has gone up, but you have to make a really conscious you have to make a conscious change to keep your pitch at a particular different level the whole time. It's, it's really a lot of work until you get into the point where you're used to doing that. This is my friend um, Sophie. Sophie um, ran a stage at uh, Reading Pride and, uh, and I, my, my band was one of the acts. Um, and uh, she's, she's a really good friend of mine and she's one of the people that I interviewed about her voice um, and these are some of the things that she has to say about it. First of all, she said, the voice gives everything away. It's got a much bigger role than it should have. So for her, the voice is saying something that she's not happy about. She doesn't feel that the way that she speaks represents her. Um, and it's largely to do with pitch. Um, in the small scale piece of research that we did, we had a number of different speakers from different gender and transgender backgrounds. And the one thing that made um, listeners most likely to rate the speaker as male was a low pitch. Um, it was that. So what she finds is that because of the way she speaks, she often gets misgendered. So if she's speaking and people can't see her, then they'll assume it's a man that's speaking. Um, she says in some cases this is deliberate, but it's not always deliberate. Often it's non-deliberate, but it's still hurtful. And even when people see her and look at her and hear her speaking, she still has some people misgendering her, which she finds very hard. So the, she doesn't feel that her voice represents her particularly well. But what she does have is a number of strategies for dealing with this. So first of all, if she's on the phone, she will always say, hello, this is Sophie. 
So she'll say that name, which is a female name, so that people know they're speaking to a female person. So she'll deliberately do that. And she also uses quite breathy voice as well. She tends to do that too, because that's something that's more associated with women than with men. And she does also try to raise her pitch, although she has said to me that it is difficult to do this and she finds it quite challenging to keep it up. So we've got these different issues, female to male, physical changes happen largely, the voice drops and that is the thing that will help people identify you as male if they're listening to your voice. From, uh, for male to female, we've got this issue where um, we've already got the physical change that has happened in a lot of cases, and it's difficult, to, um, it's difficult to control it. So actually having a voice that represents you as a transgender person can be a real challenge. OK, just to end with writing a popular science book. This is the book I've always wanted to write. I don't do research in, in any of these areas, just small scale bits and pieces. My research is on um, intonation in children with speech and language deficits and um, global Englishes, pronunciation in global Englishes, mostly Hong Kong English, Malaysian English, Southeast Asian Englishes. Nobody wants to ask me about that. If I'm asked about anything, it is accents. Um, I'm also asked about things like spelling. I was on the radio talking for um, 20 minutes on the apostrophe. I mean, for heaven's sake. Um, <laughs> or people want to talk to you about things like, uh, like, I was like, and he was like, or this sort of thing, or why people say so all the time, this kind of thing. People want to talk about that. That's not speech, though. But I wanted to write a book about the things that I've always been interested in, which is the way that people speak. So where it started um, was with my dad. This is my dad here and my mum. Um, my dad was born in 1911, so he was quite old, <coughs> nearly, nearly 60 when I came along. And my mum was born in 1928, so she was 38 when, uh, when I came along. Um, and the pair of them were both very, very keen for me to speak properly, very, very keen. And the interesting thing about this is that my dad was um, one of nine very, very working class uh, from the Old Kent Road in South London. He claims that you could hear Bow Bells, which is possible because there weren't so many high rise buildings. I'm not sure. But he would have had a very, very London sounding um, ac accent to start with. Uh, his father had a barrow at Covent Garden Market and he worked with his dad on that barrow to start with. But when he was a young man, he decided he wanted to get a job in a bank. And to do that, he had to change the way that he spoke. So he was very aware that the way that you speak affects the way that you're perceived and can affect your career prospects. And he was always, always coming down on me like a ton of bricks. If I sounded a bit too fat it, he was like, what, what are you saying? Come on, you speak properly. It's, it's those shoes, not them shoes, that kind of thing. Straight out of My Fair Lady. And my mum was responsible for that part because she loved her musicals. And we both loved My Fair Lady very much. And in a way, my dad's story is Eliza Doolittle's story because he was the Barrow Boy person in Covent Garden Market who got the job in the bank. And the other thing that happens when Eliza finally decides she's had enough misogynistic rubbish from uh, Higgins and co, <laughs> is she bails out and moves in with, um, with Higgins's mother and he comes to visit her and then he, and he says, well, how are you going to support yourself? What are you going to do? And she says, I'll teach phonetics. <laughs> and that's kind of what I ended up doing. So there we go. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this kind of story of my life, but I should also just tell you that how it developed, I was very fortunate in that I had an advocate on my side, and that advocate is David Crystal. Does anyone know David Crystal? This is David Crystal here. David Crystal has written over a hundred books on it, on the English language and speech and, and other things to do with language. And he, um, he was a professor at Reading University um, many years ago, and we had an event. Um, to celebrate 50 years of linguistics and phonetics at Reading and he came and was a speaker and I said to him you know I'd like to be doing more of the kind of thing that you're doing more public engagement um, and he said well why don't you write a book and he put me in touch with um, Oxford University Press and the rest is history really this gentleman here is Professor John Wells um, emeritus professor at UCL who's also written a number of books on pronunciation and a dictionary 
um, Michael Ashby, uh, Dr. Michael Ashby from UCL, um, Jeff Lindsay from UCL, and that's me. And this is on the summer course in English phonetics. So if anyone's interested in that, let me know. August, two weeks in August every year, it is great fun. Um, and I get to, to teach phonetics along with a whole load of other people for two weeks to a big mix of people. And it, it really is um, something that's very, very enjoyable indeed. You've also got to pitch these things right. So I'm used to writing academic texts. I'm used to writing academic papers, academic books and stuff and so on. And uh, we had a lot of work on how to write for a popular audience. But fortunately, I'd been blogging for a bit. I've not done a, a lot of blogging, but I do blog and I'd had a bit of a go at that. Um, and so OUP were quite happy that I was pitching it right. And the other thing is seeing it through. If you're going to write a book, oh boy, it's kind of hard work. I'd say it probably took about two years for, until I submitted the manuscript, but I know there are people where it takes a lot longer. It probably took me about six months to actually write it. So a lot of that time was research, going through things that I thought people would be interested in, interviewing people, working out what I was going to say. There's a, there's a good chapter on um, professional voices as well. So I interviewed a load of DJs and uh, um, p uh, radio personalities where they say it's all about the voice. You hear us, you don't really see us. Um, but Having a good support network in place is, is very important. So if you are thinking about writing a popular book, make sure you've got somebody who can make you a cup of tea and prod you along. That's what you need, really. OK, so this is uh, the story of, of me and my book. It's a little bit about how we speak, why we speak the way we do, differences in the way that we speak in different communities. What this says is, thank you. <laughs> So you say you, your, your research interest is children with speech difficulties. Um, do they have problems because their voice doesn't, uh, are they another group of people whose voice doesn't convey who they are? It's actually a, a range of, of different issues. So it, it can be that um, with children, uh, sometimes it's a, well, it's, it's usually a developmental issue. So it could be a physical thing like cleft palate, for example. Um, where um, the articulators are not fully formed and so it's difficult to make certain kinds of sounds. Um, the children, the population that I've mostly looked at are children with something called Williams syndrome. Has anyone heard of Williams syndrome? Um, so Down syndrome is an addition on a chromosome uh, which causes a number of, uh, of different um, features of Downs. Williams is a deletion on a chromosome and you get a very simil similar cognitive profile uh, across those two groups. But from a speech point of view, it's very different. Williams children um, like to talk. They're very gregarious and they like to engage with people. And the issue with Williams children is that they don't receive as well as they produce. Um, so you don't always, you can't always have confidence that they've understood what it is that you've said to them. Um, but we were looking at whether, I mean, we work on speech prosody, so um, rhythm and, um, and pitch patterns and so on. We were looking at what we could tell about that um, and whether you could use it in remediation to help children um, understand their own speech patterns better and, and change the way that they speak and also help parents understand what's going on when they're interacting with their kids. Um, so for, for Downs children, they tend to be quite withdrawn. I mean, there, there is a big mixture. It's not possible to say everyone's withdrawn. It's like saying, you know, everyone who sounds like this comes from this place. Um, but generally speaking, they're, they're more withdrawn and they don't like to speak as much. And we see different sorts of speech features. So it's telling us about things to do with um, cognitive development. Um, it's feeding into what we know about psychology, general, typical children. We have to compare with typically aged matched and cognitively matched children too. Um, but we're, what we're really looking to see is how this can support speech therapists in remediating any speech and language issues that children have. Um, because we're working with children, they're not kind of thinking so much about their identities with their voices. That's, this is something that comes a bit later on um, when you sort of 
get just before puberty, you really start thinking more about your voice and the way that you sound. And, and we get this, um, there, there was the sketch with um, Kevin the teenager, wasn't it, where he hits 13 and suddenly he's kind of like <laughs> no. So the speech suddenly changes. Um, and you do see that when people become more aware, socially aware of what's going on, that they pay more attention to this sort of stuff. And that's not something that I've worked on with children with speech and language deficits. Um, but we have, we, we submitted a grant proposal to look on older kids and we didn't get funded. So not yet anyway, thank you. You talked about the, the arm and the arm delineation. Um, I, I was interested, obviously we do still have differences though between regional accents. So yes, Cornish yes. is a very different accent to say yeah. a London accent. Yeah. So why, are there any theories on why say arm has gone but there are still quite distinct differences that haven't gone away even though we've got more migration and mass media and things? There are a number of different maps um, that you can that you can see with this research that was done by Adrian Lehman and colleagues. And actually, if you put Scon map of Britain in, you get to the page Cambridge University where it's got some of these other maps. And if we're looking at the last last thing, for example, there's much less change, but last is moving south, which is interesting. It's not moving very far south, but it is actually moving. Um, a lot of it is to do, as I say, with kind of moving around where, where people stay in the same place and where they don't. So if people are um, if people are around the London area, then they're more likely to be moving towards the London area to work. And people in London are more likely to move outside of London because it's too expensive to live in London. So you get kind of migration both ways and you get that sort of mixing. Whereas if you're all the way down in, in the West Country, then you, you may not decide that you want to do that sort of thing. So we're going to get those accents not changing quite so much. Um, also, a lot of it is to do with identity. So some accents have a, a, a much stronger identity than others, and some people have a much stronger identity with their accents than others. So there's a lot of tribalism going on as well. And some things are sort of more identifiable. So the last, last thing, um, it's a bit of a competition actually sometimes going on with that. Um, and in fact, when, if I show the map with, with um, last moving south um, at the open days, I often get people at the back going, yay, <laughs> because they think it's, it's interesting that that's happening. Um, why some change and why others? It's, it's really difficult to say. We can't always pinpoint exactly what's happened. Um, with the last last thing, the, the R, so bath, bath, the bath version was actually, um, it, it, it was fashion. So people in London decided they wanted to use this. And because people in London were considered to be, you know, very kind of socially um, attractive and so on. And we want to sort of be like that because if we're like that, we sound posh and we sound like we come from these groups. It was adopted by um, the southern part of Britain, which is really interesting. And that, that is just fashion. So sometimes it can just be a particular person speaking in a particular way that can spark something off. Um, but exactly why is, is really, really hard to pinpoint, really difficult. But a lot of it's to do with movement around. Two questions, if I may, very practical questions. <laughs> so, for example, when we're interviewing people, um, are there strategies to avoid <coughs> kind of discrimination due to the person's accent, kind of on the one hand? And on the other hand, um, I present uh, quite a lot in, uh, to an external audience in Asia, what can I do with my accent to help them kind of get more from a, a non-native speaker kind of standpoint? Okay, so when you're speaking English, you yes. mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, from my point of view, it's more important to be clearly spoken <coughs> than it is to have a particular kind of accent. Um, so the point is, is getting your meaning across. And for me, that doesn't matter whether you're speaking um, a regional accent uh, from a particular place or whether you're speaking a more widespread accent or whether you're speaking a reference accent like um, General American or um, received pronunciation standards Southern British, whatever. That there are people out there who have um, General American and Southern Standard British who are not very clearly spoken, who you wouldn't understand. So, I mean, listening, just listening to you ask the question, it sounds to me like you're very clearly spoken. So I'd say don't do anything. Just continue to speak in a clear way because that, that's what's important as far as I'm concerned. The, 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 the accents thing is, is more of a problem. But it, again, it will depend on where you're from. So if you're from 
England or Britain, then you'll understand that we've got these accent prejudices. You'll know it happens, but you won't always realise exactly. Um, it, it's the sort of um, unconscious bias training thing. You won't always realise that you're having a reaction against that. Um, so it's being aware, really, that you're not judging someone on their accent, that you're judging them on what they're saying and, and you know, what the meaning is. And there, there was, uh, again, I've, I've mentioned in the book that there was some research with something like 700 employers about uh, this uptalk thing. So when people go up at the end of a sentence instead of going down. So I'm, I'm going to tell you about my book now. And uh, I wrote it the other day. It was really quick. And I spent five minutes. And I'm going up at the end. And what they found is that employers were saying, well, we don't like this feature because it sounds, it doesn't sound confident. It sounds like people are unsure about what they're saying but in 50 years time the interviewers are probably going to have that pattern so by then it's not it might not matter anymore I mean we don't we don't know exactly what's going to happen we never do but once something is so widespread it stops being a problem but also if you're not from a community if you're not from Britain you won't have the same attitudes about accents from that country. And if I go to um, Hong Kong, for example, where I lived for several years, um, and I hear people speaking from different Chinese language backgrounds, they just sound like they're speaking English with different Chinese language backgrounds. I wouldn't be able to say, oh, I'm going to discriminate against them because they come from this place. I wouldn't know that. But I do know that discrimination goes on in Hong Kong because I've witnessed it. it was, oh, they're speaking with a, this accent. We don't want to. So it, it's... For me, it's um, if you're going to do any kind of unconscious bias training, I think it's important to include the way that people speak in it um, and to get people to realise that the message is more important than, um, than those sorts of aspects or that you need to recognise if you're having a negative reaction to them. You've spoken, I think, mostly about pronunciation of individual words. What about, say, the cadence in the Liverpudlian accent and how has that evolved and remained? How has it resisted change over time? I don't know because I'm not an expert on the Liverpool accent. I can't tell you, I'm afraid. Um, it, it, there's supposed to be influences from, from Irish in there um, and also North Wales. Um, and uh, Wales, and when I, when I showed you the map, um, before, the, um, before the Romans actually and during the Romans, um, Britain was mostly inhabited by a, a group of people called the Insular Celts. And again, they weren't a, a single group. They were lots of different speakers. When the Saxons arrived, they basically pushed those speakers into Wales. Um, and the word Wales means foreigners um, in, in Anglo-Saxon language, so it's quite interesting. So um, you do get some features of uh, North Walian accents as well in Liverpool. So it, it's a bit of a mixture, but I can't really tell you any more than that because I've not done any research on Liverpool and I've not spent time looking at it. Um, but I have to say, it's one of my favourite accents. I love it. I can't say, I'm not allowed to say any accent is bad, but I can say that I really like listening to people from Liverpool. Um, just, just because, you, like you say, the cadence is so interesting and, and the, the sound changes and the way that people are using language. It, it is fascinating. I just moved here from the US uh, six months ago and I found it very interesting how many accents there are in Britain in like a comparatively smaller landmass. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in the US we have kind of like large regional accents. There's like a southern accent but you can also find somebody who sounds like me anywhere mm -hmm. in the US. Mm. And I've always found that interesting. And do you know anything about why, like, there's kind of one American accent that has been so prol proliferated so much throughout the country? Um, the English that's spoken in America, um, I mean, first of all, again, it, it's a mixture because a lot of people from a lot of different places um, went to America, a, lo a lot of people. From an English point of view, from a, from a, a, a British point of view, um, the southern states were the first, uh, southeastern states were the first that were colonized. Um, and those speakers uh, would have had an R, so they would have said that. So we're talking about Jamestown, Virginia, that, that sort of area. Um, the speakers who settled further up the coast in the northeast were mostly from the east side of um, England, where there wasn't an R. So you get those sorts of accents there that sound closer in a way to what British English sounds like now in comparison with some other accents. Um, 
but you know again it, it's it's a big a big mix um, but there's there have been some interesting studies done um, on New York accents where you get uh, there was one looking at social social stratification in New York looking at the way that people in um, a department store spoke English and whether they had the R or not and it was found that the lower class speakers didn't so the kind of New York that kind of thing rather than New York the lower class speakers didn't have the R and the upper class speakers did so there are a range of accents going on but because um, you've got people moving to the country en masse, there's been more levelling. That would be my suggestion, um, that there, there's just more, more levelling that you get there. Even though, you know, people were in different places, you, but you do, like you say, you, you've got this kind of north and south thing going on. And then over in California, you get different sorts of accents happening and different voice features happening. So the whole creaky, creaky voice thing is supposed to have come from over there, you know, this sort of sound. And also the rising pitch, that's another thing that's associated with um, California valley girl type speak. So it's not the case that you don't get other accents, but you do, like you say, I think you get fewer generally, but you are going to see social ones. And then, of course, we've got other people who came in from other backgrounds that were using English for other reasons, including African Americans who have a very different way of speaking, um, Hispanics who have a very different way of speaking English. So from a sort of white Anglo-Saxon point of view, it tends to be one or two. But if you bring in all of the other speakers of English who will have got English from um, colonization of different parts of the world, um, you've actually got a very, very rich mix going on in the States, but it will be for different reasons from what happened in England. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for coming. <coughs> uh, I also moved from the States a couple of months ago, uh, and I have uh, two young kids, so I've been curious to see how their, their accents adopt and kind of change <clears throat> over time. And we no I noticed um, my son, who's almost six, adopted this sort of intonation for questions. And you know, I'm sort of familiar with like the upspeak yeah. thing, but I, w I don't know if you have a name for this where it'll be like, um, it's almost like a, this extra movement mm -hmm. thing. We're saying, oh, a Jane, mm -hmm. as opposed to Jane, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. A, a single direction thing. Is, do you have a name for Yes, that, that's, called, that's called a fall rise. Um, something I was asked about was um, Meghan Markle, now the Duchess of Sussex in speech, and whether she her accent had changed. And we did, actually Adrian Lehman and I and another colleague did a small article for the conversation. And we said from a vowel point of view, there hadn't been any change. And another colleague of mine looked at her intonation and said she's using this falling rising pitch. This, oh really, this sort of thing, she's doing that, which is not a typically American pitch. You don't find it, it's a very British sounding thing. Um, it's actually been suggested that some societies reject the fall rise because they don't want to be associated with British English. So that's quite interesting. Oh, I've got no idea whether that's really what's going on. It's just an interesting suggestion. But, but that's it. And a full rise is more tentative sounding. It's more kind of checking sounding. It's more I'm not sure sounding. Um, so it could be that people in Britain do this um, to, uh, I don't know, indicate that um, they're trying to give some sort of ground or give the impression that they're giving some sort of ground and you get this sort of full rise patterns. Whereas Americans don't tend to do this. So you'll get a rising pattern where it just goes Jane, as you say, rather than Jane. That kind of thing. So yeah, um, it's it's a very British pattern, the full rise. Um, yes, that's what it's called. It's called a full rise. Please join me in thanking Jane Sutter one more time. Thanks. Thank you.